Where do you think most people go wrong in telling their personal stories? Too much information, too little? Um, too much information or too little, possibly each. But um, getting back to what we were talking about is, yeah, there can be too much information which um, about the events and all of that, which actually masks what's really going on in the character. Or there could be too little information about the character. Here's, but here's the um, a real key. Many times when we're doing these workshops or working with somebody who's doing this kind of writing, um, I will say quite honestly to them, it's a great story, but you're not in it. And they'll go, what do you mean? No, no, I was there and I told you. I said, no, no, you were there. You were the observer. The way you told the story, you were the observer. More like a journalist. You were the observer and you told us all the details and you gave us a little indication like, oh, yeah, in that moment, oh, and I was really scared or something like that. And I go, okay. But the thing is, you are not really in the story. You have kept yourself out of the story. Now, this story that the, this person has told quite possibly could be a very traumatic story. Frightening. One of those stories that generates a lot of fear. And now what can happen as a result of telling the story like that is as you're telling the story, even keeping yourself some very much out of the story, all those fears will come back because they're, you're, it's, it's wired into your system. Those fears and everything are in your body and you are stimulating them again. And so you will feel the fear or feel the joy, feel the confusion, whatever, as you're telling the story. The problem is you will think that the audience is feeling the same thing. And I can tell you right now, they're not. They're not. There's no reason for them because they're not you. They will, each member of the audience will be feeling whatever they feel. They say, oh, that, that's funny. Oh, that's, that's kind of sad. They, it's, it's a wide range of what they could be feeling. I think autobiographical, the goal of autobiographical storytelling is can I tell you a story? Can I tell you a story like about my 10th birthday? And in such a way that I can take you through the story and you are moment by moment feeling and experiencing exactly what I felt as the 10-year-old at that moment while the story is being told without telling you, oh, in that moment I felt really scared. Then you could, Now that's just a piece of information that will not stimulate a feeling within you. My job as the storyteller is to stimulate emotion within you, not just give you information. So this, when you ask about too much information, too little information, it's usually too little of the real meat that we want, which is what is going on inside the character. I want to know what you're thinking or feeling. Most people won't do that. They just won't, by instinct, they won't do that. It's sort of a preservation instinct. So then we will listen to the story and we'll have our own reaction to it based on our life experience. That's it. Which was we got to, which we talked about with why people like certain films and certain stories. Now <clears throat> you could tell a story to a group of a dozen people without having yourself really present in the story, and those dozen people will have about a dozen different reactions to the story based on their life experience, as if if this had happened to them, this is how they would respond. But the more powerful story is they know exactly how you were feeling, how you were responding. And now they're not responding to just the story. They're responding to your experience, your emotional experience through the story, and that's much more powerful. Was there a story that had power over you <clears throat> that then you were able to tell so many times and then you switched it and now you had power over that story that was your story? Well, you know, in the 30 years of doing this, is that what you mean? Whenever. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years and one, um, it's a great question, Karen. And one thing I realized very early on when I started to um, work either with individual performers doing solo shows or work with a group like a workshop or even a larger group, what I was asking all of those writers or those artists or those human beings, those people to do was 
dig into their past, have a story, and start to really explore it in a very open, raw, vulnerable way. And in order to really ask them to take those that, that leap, the best way I could um, help them do that was to tell my own stories. So I would always, in every workshop, tell a story or, be t or tell several stories to give them examples not only of how the story works or how the storytelling techniques, which I was trying to teach them, work, but um, it's that simple thing, and this it has to do with directing. Don't ask an actor to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. So I couldn't ask these people to write something that I wasn't willing to do. So I need to do it and do it in front of them. And many times during that, I would um, purposely set myself a high challenge, <clears throat> just in terms of the story that I would pick or the what I was going to talk about. I would push myself to say, can I go a little bit further? Can I, go a li can I get into a more dangerous area? And there was one time, and Elsha was there, that I told a story in Hawaii that had happened just two weeks earlier, which was devastating to me. It was a devastating story. And it was humiliating and brought a lot of shame to me and embarrassment. And I'd only told one person about it, my sister, who was also in the workshop at that time. And, but basically I was hiding it from the rest of the world. And then I decided in that workshop, I was gonna tell a part of that story. And I did, and it was a struggle, it was hard, but it was liberating. And um, so yes, that's, you know, I've had that experience many times going, wow, now I've done that, I can, I can do it again. So that my assessment that telling tough stories, traumatic stories, embarrassing or shameful stories again and again and again, the, the balance will change. I've also experienced that within my own storytelling. Have you seen there are some people have, they're just, unabashedly open about everything. I mean, there's just people that I'm just shocked they would put something on Twitter, but they, that's just who they are as, as human beings. There, there's no shame in anything. Mm -hmm. Everything's an open book. Maybe they came from a family that's like that, and mm -hmm. so that's how they communicated. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's other people that they're afraid to tell you what they had for breakfast, right? and they're super reserved, and you feel like every question you ask, even about the weather, is somehow a personal intrusion. Mm -hmm. Do you see those people interacting at your workshop together and just, just you know, the, the ones with the arms crossed where yeah. it's not even that they, they don't like somebody, but there's just, that's who they are. They're, they're just maybe not as trusting. And other people that they'll tell the cashier at the store some intimate detail from their love life. Yeah, I mean, the thing is in the workshops, we get a whole range of people. And it's interesting because they, they just using your two examples, the one who would just, the ones who just will blurt out anything personal and the other ones who are much more reserved and are afraid to even tell you their birthday or whatever, whatever it is. Um, we, we get that range, definitely that range. The first thing that's really interesting is at the beginning of the workshop, what we do is we check in with each person in front of everybody, not, not privately, why they're there, what they, what they really want and just sometimes hearing what they want is interesting. And very quickly we get a sense of the personality and maybe Elsha and I have talked to this person beforehand or met them online or something so we have a sense of who they are before they come into the workshop. But we, we, we check in with them to see what their goals are. And we get a sense that this one is very reserved and this, let's say this woman is so reserved and as you said, sort of like that and it's not gonna talk about anything. And we say, well, I wonder why she's here. And, but then we have a feeling this, is gonna, this workshop is going to be tough for her or a shock for her. And sometimes that person will, by the end of the three days, because it's just a three-day workshop, will explode and something will come out. And sometimes my feeling is they're there unconsciously because they want to release. Now on the other end, the ones who will exp um, say everything, expose everything, we have to watch them carefully too <laughs> because they can take over. We have people who come in and want to show us how it's done. And we know they're gonna run into a shock but when we start talking to them about some of the things I've talked to you about, they go, what, what do you mean I don't know myself? And um, there's another part of this which 
we can talk, you and I can talk about today about how we use interrogation in this process. But because we interrogate that person, if I were to interrogate you as the 12 year old, the one that answered the door for the one that answered the door. So this woman over here is telling a story about herself and whatever, and then we interrogate her at that time. Now suddenly she's aware that she has she's not as free as she thought she was. Then there's and and that person will go most likely go through a change during the three days. And there's another huge part of this workshop is that it's a workshop. There are maybe a dozen people there. And every single person is working on an autobiographical story. Every single person is struggling with their own obstacles, their own resistance, their own um, self-esteem, whatever it is they're struggling with. So you're in a room that is really rather unique. The energy in the room is extraordinary. So that shy one who won't say anything is being encouraged by the ones, others that she sees who are struggling, who make breakthroughs. The, the one who thinks she knows and everything is also going to benefit by experiencing what the other ones are going through. So that's a big part of the workshop is just to be in that environment for those three days and be immersed in that world of autobiographical storytelling and struggling with your own story, writing your story, rewriting your story, listening to other people, seeing them make breakthroughs, seeing them not make breakthroughs and not be able to get through an obstacle and seeing how frightening that is. All of that impacts everybody. So the the truth is when Elsha and I do these workshops, we have no idea what's going to happen. We do the workshop pretty much the same way every time. But then after it's all over, Elsha and I sit down and discuss, could we improve? How could we change? What new things could we try? And we come up with some new things. But pretty much generally it's the same thing. It's the environment that the people are plunged into that causes the change. Interesting. So the extrovert that is, is, a, is sort of free spirit and tells everybody everything can learn from the reserved oh, introvert yes. with arms crossed and vice versa. Yes. Yes, and the extrovert may learn very graphically or just very subtly that her (coughs) explosion of stories that she puts out is actually covering up the story. She's not revealing anything except an ego. Is it a defense mechanism though, Uh hide? Could be. I'm just saying could be. I don't know. It depends on the person. That I'm going to tell you this and I'm going to tell you that and I'm going to... Do you remember the, the, the film American Beauty? Yes. Great. Remember Angela, the, the little cheerleader? Oh, yes. Who was just t- talking about her sexual exploits forever and ever and ever and ever and ever <laughs> until the end when she said, this is my first. Well, that was a cover-up. Those stories, the stories she was telling was a cover-up for her insecurities that she is, as she said, ordinary. She was afraid of just being ordinary, that nobody would want her. So she creates this whole myth about everybody wants her. Right, and Wes Bentley, who is a drug dealer, I guess, in the the Mm -hmm. film, kind of almost downplays his intelligence Mm -hmm. in a way, and you don't realize how deep and like feeling he is, but I don't know. It's been a while since I've seen it, but I love it. Yeah, so I mean, that's just an example. So yeah, the extrovert and the introvert will learn from other, and they, and the, the extent of what they learn may not um, resonate within them till weeks or months later. Because of this experience, they may start to see things differently. They may start to tell their stories differently. Who knows? It's very powerful. And it, it is a healing process. In the first workshops I did in Hawaii the first few years, there was a um, married couple um, I think it was Mary and John, I think that's, that's their name. Anyway, and they took it for several years. Very couple. They were very unique, yeah. only in one way. <clears throat> they would each have their story they were going to tell. And as <clears throat> we learned quickly after the first year or so, that John would start telling the story. And the thing that was, watch Mary, because Mary has probably never heard this story before. They would each tell stories in the workshop that they had never told each other before. And by the end of several years, the last time I saw them, they said that workshop made such a difference in their marriage 
you know, because it gave them a safe place to be more open and more um, available and more transparent.